Well, we're privileged today to have with us Ajith Fernando, who has uh, been working with Youth for Christ in Sri Lanka as national director for 35 years, and you're now the teaching director of Youth for Christ, where you mentor leaders and you train and teach staff and volunteers. You're, you have a very active international ministry. You've written 15 books in 19 languages, and that's a long time on the road. And what we want to talk to you about today is this whole issue of what are the secrets to long-term freshness, because all of us in Christian ministry need this so much. So perhaps you could start for us, Ajith, by telling us well, what does it mean to, to maintain freshness in Christian ministry? Yes, as, as I think about it, uh, I think uh, freshness is a result of us being graced people. Uh, in 2, Tim 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 1, Paul says, therefore having this ministry by the mercy of God, we don't lose heart. And uh, consciously uh, receiving grace all the time uh, so that the most important factor in our life is not the challenges we face, not the crises, not the nasty things people do to us, but the grace of God. If that is there, I think we will remain fresh amidst all the pain that comes inevitably as we are involved in ministry. Our grace and mercy go very much together, don't they? So yes. how, how does mercy uh, characterize all of Christian life and ministry? Yeah, again, it, it's because ministry comes, ministry is a result of grace. And uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 says, because we have it from the mercy of God. Paul was very conscious about the fact that he didn't deserve being in ministry. Uh, he, uh, in 1 Timothy 1, uh, talking about his own call, he says that he's the, he's the chief of sinners, and yet mercy was given to him. Grace superabounded. So a conscious awareness of the fact that what we are is not because of any great thing about us, but it's just that God in his mercy has chosen to serve us. I think that's a very refreshing, joyful thought. I think many, many Christians and Christian leaders struggle with this. That, uh, can you talk us through some of the things that, that rob Christian leaders of their freshness yes. in ministry? Uh, you know, in the same passage that Paul talks about, he says, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. In other words, he remains fresh. And then he says, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhand ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word, but by open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Uh, what he's saying is, because ministry comes from grace, nothing that hinders grace must be allowed in our life. Constantly we are bombarded by another perspective on life, another perspective on what is success. Uh, and uh, the world keeps telling us, you're not significant, you're not important. And, and, we t uh, uh, and in the process of, doing, uh, of receiving this signal, we try to uh, receive significance by using methods that are uh, not uh, in keeping with God's ways, such as competition uh, and, uh, you know, uh, personal ambition, uh, cutting others down to go up, which is the way of the world. Uh, and if we uh, go that route, we forfeit grace, mm. and then we lose our freshness. Mm. We become insecure people. Mm. We all need to be filled with, with Christ's Spirit and uh, we need the anointing of God in order to minister for him. But could you, you've mentioned this idea of forfeiting yeah. God's anointing. Yeah. How might people risk forfeiting God's anointing in their life and ministry? Uh, of course, the, the, the first thing that comes to mind is sin. Um, but I would like to put it as a, a, a sense of dependence upon God. If we lose that sense of dependence on God, uh, then we, we begin to do it on our own strength. Uh, they used to say that uh, Charles, uh, Charles Spurgeon 
when he went to the pulpit, as he was walking to the pulpit, he would say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. A conscious recognition that our ministry is not from our ability, but uh, because of God. Uh, if that recognition is there, then anything that hinders God, we would just run to God and say, Lord, please, please, please help me. Uh, uh, forgive me for what I've done. Uh, just, uh, uh, just take away this hindrance to me. It's that sense of need that, that is at the heart of effectiveness in ministry, and I would say anointing. Paul says to the Thessalonians, he exhorts them to rejoice always yeah. and to give thanks yeah. in all circumstances. Can you talk to us a little bit about the role of joy yeah. and thankfulness in maintaining fresh, freshness in ministry and, and, and how that works out practically? You know, a few years ago, I, I came across uh, several words that have in Greek uh, the root chi and rho, chi rho. I call it the chi rho family. And um, ch and r, if you were to put it in English. Uh, and um, um, it gives us a good understanding of the sequence that takes place in the life of a Christian's walk with God. Uh, the first is charis which is grace, and we are graced people. And then when we receive grace and salvation with it, um, we receive charisma, which is, uh, which is giftedness. So God has dealt with one of two of the most important issues in our life, our identity. We become children of God through salvation, and our significance. Uh, we become people who have been gifted and have a significant role to play in the kingdom. And when you are aware of that, uh, Eucharistia is the result, uh, or thanksgiving. When you realize, I have received from God, and you are living with the constant awareness of being a recipient of grace, uh, then you become a thankful person. And a thankful person is a joyful person. And that brings us to the fourth word in the Cairo family, which is kara, joy. So joy is basically just the joy of knowing that God loves us, that God is blessing us, that God is with us, that he's for us. And out of that kara springs uh, karizomai, which is to freely give. And that's the last word in the... Uh, in, in that Cairo family that I, uh, that I mentioned. Uh, karizomai uh, is... Uh, uh, is also translated forgive sometimes. Because even as we face the blows of ministry, having received from God His grace, we have the strength to forgive. So it's the joy that gives us the strength to keep on serving Him. Now you've hinted here about God taking joy in us and delighting in us. What does that actually mean? Yeah. You know, you know, uh, uh, some years ago, again, I, I made this discovery. I, I used to spend a lot of time thinking about why God asked us to delight in the law and to delight in Him. And then there is this whole a group of texts in the Scriptures that says that God delights in us. Um, we are not only people who receive grace as an impersonal gift that is thrown down from heaven. Grace opens the door for us to becoming children of God. And parents delight in their children. At least parents should delight in their children. And, uh, and that realization that God delights in us is one of the most refreshing things about us. I had this friend who was a Norwegian bishop. Hakan Andersen was his name. And he was a member of the Lausanne Committee. And he came once to our meetings just after a very serious heart attack. And he shared his testimony during one of the devotions on what he went through. And in this, he, he talks about how when he was just recovering uh, from very serious, I mean, he thought he was, he, he was going to die. Uh, his son asked him, uh, Daddy, when you were 
going through that de- difficult experience, were you thinking about God? And Bishop Anderson said, son, I don't know whether I was thinking about God, but the only hope I had was that God was thinking about me. Uh, and, and, and the greatest thing about us is not what we think about God, not what we do for God, but that God thinks about us and that he, what he does for us. And that's a very liberating thought. And, and I think that is the thing that gives us great joy. The greatest aspect of the joy of the Lord is the fact that God delights in us. And we can believe that because grace is always greater than our sin. And in spite of all our weaknesses, his grace comes greater. And, and that delighting uh, of God in us helps us to del- delight in, in not only God but in life itself. The Christian psychiatrist Marjorie Foyle wrote a very famous book called Honorably Wounded. And in that, she's addressing the issue of people who get wounded or injured in God's service. And many of us who are involved in Christian ministry will have times of real hurt in our lives. So can you tell us how when we're facing these times of hurt, do we find God's healing and restoration to go on? Yeah, I think this is one of the most important keys in Christian ministry is to have what I might call a theology of hurt, of pain, uh, where we see this as a regular part of life, uh, inevitable in not only in ministry, but in life itself. And... um, And so Paul uh, talks about this a lot in uh, uh, all over, right, all over his ministry, but uh, he he talks about the God of our Father, uh, you know, in in, uh, in 2 Timothy, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, Mm. blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Mm. the God of all comfort, Mm. who comforts us in our affliction. Um, To see God as a God who comforts us uh, and God has a way of comforting his children. And to seek God's comfort, refusing to give up. Uh, Just like uh, Jacob, you know, when he was scared, his brother was coming, he refused to give up. He said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And God has a way of ministering to us. I remember once I was, uh, you know, having a lot of conflict in our ministry and some of the staff were very critical of me. Mm. And uh, I uh, came back home feeling just terrible. <laughs> no, I had been attacked. And, uh, and I went to bed and I just started crying. Mm-hmm. And my son walked into the room and he had never seen me crying. Mm. He was a teenager at that time. And he went and told his mother, what's happening? He, Father is crying. And uh, she said, yeah, he's having problems, he's having difficulties, and he's hurt. And, um, and then he went to my computer and got my email list. <laughs> and he knows who my good friends are. Mm-hmm. And he sent them a letter. Uh, Please pray for my father. He's going through a difficult time, mm-hmm. and he needs your prayers. Mm-hmm. You know, when I found that out, I was so thrilled. You know, and it was God's way, you know, when I had faced rejection uh, in my ministry mm. to find acceptance through my son. Mm. And you know, the problems that we talked about are all forgotten and they're, 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 they're behind their history. But I will never forget the kindness of my son. Uh, my, my point is that God's comfort is greater than the hurt that people give us. And, um, and uh, if we have to develop ways of finding God's comfort because God seeks to comfort us, but sometimes our own stubbornness and our own clinging to our problems uh, makes it difficult for, us to grow, uh, to, for God to break through into our lives. Uh, and I think one of the keys to this whole process of comfort is what I would call the discipline of groaning. Mm. 
Paul talks about this in Romans 8, where he says that the whole world has been... Whole creation is groaning. Yes, yes. We have been subjected to frustration. Yes. As a result of the fall. And because of that frustration, not only is the creation groaning, but we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we are believers. We inwardly groan. Yes, we also groan. And I think if we learn to groan, uh, the laments in the Old Testament, are examples of groaning. Uh, they are cries of people who are struggling. Why? Why have I got to go through this? Why, have I, why am I experiencing this pain? And they have expressed themselves to God. And the, the process of expressing yourself to God makes you open to God. And when you are open to God, you become open to God's comfort. Now, there's a difference, isn't there, between, on the one hand, groaning, yes. which God welcomes, yeah. and then, on the other hand, grumbling, yeah. which God takes a very different view of. So, what's the difference yes. between groaning and grumbling? Yeah, uh, th th that's a good question. Uh, I, think, I think, basically, the difference is that groaning, in the biblical sense, are the cries of people who have been obedient to God. Whereas grumbling comes from people who don't want to obey. Um, groaning can be very bitter, but it's the bitterness of someone who's sought to be obedient. Who's honorably wounded. Yes, who's honorably wounded. And he can't understand why. Why is it that, I mean, the, the laments are good examples. Uh, I mean, I've been faithful and I'm suffering and those guys have been wicked. And they're doing so well, they're laughing at me. How long is this going to last? I mean, that's a typical lament. But, but people who groan are people who have been faithful. Grumblers are those, for example, who refuse to accept a leader who has come to them. Yes. And they, they don't want this leader, so they just keep grumbling against that leader. And you can grumble against anybody if you want. Um, but groaning is what helps us to avoid quitting. If, if you have realized that it's okay to groan, that it's Christian to have faith in God and realize that your faith is not producing a comfortable life for you at this time. Uh, if you know that it's okay, then you won't quit. I think today many people are missing God's best because they haven't learned to groan. They want a comfortable life. And I mean, nowhere in the Bible is... Christianity presented as a comfortable place, you know. Uh, people say, I want to go to a church that, where I'm comfortable. I don't think the church was ever a comfortable place. And um, uh, it's that, um, if, you, if you look at comfort in that sense, then you will quit. You will change churches. You will change your job. Uh, you, you will give up uh, your call to a difficult people. Because, uh, because you expect life to go well. But if you have this theology of groaning, I think then you can uh, face the pain and, and go on uh, knowing that it's okay to be crying, to be hurting, that it's okay, that God accepts it, and that we groan to God. And of course, when you groan to God, God is going to minister to you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Well, Jesus promised his disciples that they would face tribulation yeah. in this world. Yeah. And, and Paul said to Timothy that everyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. And yet the Bible also talks about the peace of God, which yes. passes understanding and which keeps our hearts and minds in Christ. Yeah. How do we, as believers, as Christian leaders, experience the peace of God as a, as a reality in our yes. lives? Uh, yeah. You know, in the passage that he quoted, um, uh, in this word you will have tribulations. Yes. Uh, but then Jesus goes on to say, take heart, I have overcome the world. Uh, peace is the result of believing. You know, uh, Romans fifteen thirteen, I think is one of the most important verses in the Bible regarding the Christian life. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. 
It is as we believe that we are able to experience God's peace. And, um, and, uh, and so there is this whole, you know, you know, there is this Greek word logizomai, uh, which is often translated reckoning or consider, consider yourselves dead to sin. Um, love does not uh, count, uh, take account of wrong. It's an attitude that says, this is important to me, and I will reckon its reality. I believe God, and this is difficult, but I believe that God is going to turn it to good. Um, even the groaning that we talked about is groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Groaning that knows that this is all going to come to an end. It's a groaning in hope. So hope and faith uh, enables us to know that it's going to be okay, and we have peace because of that. The Bible talks a lot about the way that God uses suffering yeah. in our lives, and uh, I think it's Paul who says, rejoice in your suffering, because yeah. suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Yeah. Can you talk us through this whole way of how God uses these events in our lives to mature us yeah. in life and ministry and produce in us the qualities that he's wanting to be able to use us more effectively? You know, uh, I, I made a count. I, I don't know whether this is exactly accurate, but I just went through the New Testament and I made a count of every time joy and, peace, uh, and, and suffering come together. Mm -hmm. And I found in 18 places in the Bible, joy and suffering come together. So, I would see a mature Christian as somebody who's able to have joy along with a broken heart. Paul was that. Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. But in the same book, Philippians, he says, complete my joy by being of one mind. He was broken by the, by the disunity of the church in Philippi. But he, he exhorted us to rejoice in the Lord always. Uh, joy is this bedrock reality that God is with us. Uh, and with that, we have the strength to face up to pain and to let our heart be broken. Joy is what gives us the grace to to let our hearts be broken. Um, uh, John 15, uh, there's another nice sequence. Jesus says, I have told you these things that my uh, joy may be in you and then your joy will be full. Mm. And the next verse he says, love one another as I have loved you. And then he says, greater love has no one than this, that a man gives his life for his friends. Giving your life for your friends is dying, suffering. It is in the strength of having the full joy of God that we are able to embrace suffering. And if we don't have joy, we become bitter when we suffer. And I think that is one of the most saddest things about ministry today. Many of God's servants are angry, angry with the way the church has dealt with them, not with persecution and all of that, but just the way the church has dealt with them. And, um, and that is why we have to work so hard at maintaining this joy. Uh, Paul talks about the peace of God, uh, you know, keeping our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of Christ Jesus. Uh, that's in Philippians, in, in uh, Philippians, 4. Philippians 4. In Colossians, I think it's 3.16 or 15, he says that the peace of Christ rule in you. Peace is one of those things that uh, I think it was uh, J.B. Phillips who translated that as, let the peace of Christ be your umpire. The peace of Christ gives us uh, this sense of God with us that gives us the strength to face pain. And to me, that is maturity in ministry. The ability to combine joy with a broken heart. Uh, Paul Tonier wrote a very interesting book called Creative Suffering. Uh, after the death of his wife. And in that book, he talks about how he, um, 
he lost his mother when he was a little child and his father, I think, when he was a teenager. And now his wife has died. Mm. And he says that the human, constitution, the human being is constitutionally contradictory. <laughs> and and the, the example of that, he says, is, I can tell you that I live uh, with a great grief and that I'm a happy man. I live with a great grief and I am a happy man. And I think that is what we should strive at, to know the joy of the Lord in the midst of all. And I, I, I see that as maturity in ministry. Now, in terms of the part that God's Word plays in this, the Bible talks of the truth setting us free. Yeah. And of course, that is one of the great roles of preaching is to impart the truth that sets free. Yeah. But I've heard, you being, I've heard you talking about the importance of people preaching to themselves yes. as well, yeah. uh, to remind themselves of God's truth. Why is it so important that we preach to ourselves as well as to others? Uh, I, I think it's important because what's in the mind of the Word of God uh, sometimes finds it's, it, we, we find it very difficult to let it influence our hearts. The distance between the mind and the heart is sometimes a, a long distance. And, um, and that consciously, you know, this whole idea of reckoning again, we must consciously allow the truth of God to impact us in our deeper selves. What is in the mind to come down to the heart? And one of the ways we do that is by preaching to ourselves. Um, Psalm 42 and 43, which was written by a faithful person in the midst of pain. Uh, you know, we, we sing, as the deer pants for the water, mm -hmm. so my soul longs for you. And it's a beautiful song. Mm -hmm. And we think, what a beautiful song. But it was written by a person who was struggling, mm -hmm. who was in great crisis. And God seemed to be far away from him. And uh, in those two Psalms, 42 and 43, three times he has a refrain. And in that refrain, he's preaching to himself. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. He's preaching. Yeah. Hope in God. Um, and you shall praise him because he's your strength and your salvation. So I think we need to consciously tell ourselves this is what scripture says and let that address the feelings that we have. Martin Lloyd-Jones in his book, uh, Spiritual Depression, says something like this. He says, you see, the problem with us is that we are listening to ourselves when we should be speaking to ourselves. Yes. Uh, you know, we are listening to our self-pity. Self-pity is a, such a good friend. Never disappoints. Our friends will disappoint us when we tell them about our problems. They give us advice that we don't want to hear or will not be listening to us, be judgmental. Um, self-pity never disappoints. We talk about all the pain that we have and it just agrees, yes, life has been terrible to you. So we like to listen to self-pity. But I think we need to break that cycle and break through to our lives by speaking to ourselves the Word of God. And that is what, able, what helps change our perspective so that we can have the joy and peace that comes from believing. Now, Martin Lloyd-Jones talks about taking himself in hand and reminding yes. Yes. himself of these truths, yeah. of preaching to himself. Yeah. Can you give us some tips, perhaps from your own experience, yeah. of how you preach to yourself yes. uh, in order to maintain spiritual freshness? Uh, th there are two things that I do fairly regularly when I, uh, when I have a crisis. Uh, one is to go for a walk <laughs> mm -hmm. and just be conscious of the fact that I'm in the presence of God mm -hmm. and let God's truth impact me. Mm -hmm. And when I'm able to pray, usually I'm not able to pray when I'm really upset, uh, but I'm able to be alone. I try to be alone. 
And that again is letting the presence of God minister to me. And that's a, unconsciously a way in which I preach to myself. I remember once I, 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 wrote, a, I wrote a commentary on, uh, on Acts. It's uh, in the NIV application commentary. And all the others, as far as I know, were people with earned doctorates, which I don't have. They were full-time lecturers in universities in the field of New Testament. And here was I asked to write this thing. And the first response I got from a renowned scholar was a very negative response. You know. uh, it said that the editor of HarperCollins had um, said that this is a commentary series that we could, um, that any professor in seminary could recommend to his students. And he said, with this book, we may lose that recommendation. <laughs> And it was, uh, you know, it was very... I went to, I lived near the sea at home. So I went to the beach and I just walked with God. Lord, Lord what, what can I do? What can I do? And God ministered to me. And I came back with a strong sense that I must write a commentary that is both intellectually credible and also speaks to preachers. And I think, uh, I think the book did well. It's, it's still doing well. I, I wrote it long ago, but it's still selling copies, and I think it did well. So, so walking, in other words, just separating myself to be alone with God is one of those things. The other thing that I find very helpful is singing. Um, when I'm upset and the truths of God are not uh, really impacting me as, I, as it should. I don't have words to articulate God's truth because my mood is so bad. So I go, I, I play, I'm not a good pianist at all, <laughs> but I can play for me to sing because I make mistakes and then I can stop and start again. Um, and so, so I go to the piano and I start singing. I'm a Methodist and my Methodist hymn book is my companion in life. Wherever I go, I take my Methodist hymn book with me. And, um, and so I start singing. And when I first sing, uh, I don't sing, actually. I just read. I play and I read because my mood is so bad. Mm. But little by little, what I've been singing begins to influence me. And with time, the truth of God is able to break through and overcome the sense of despondency or despair that I'm having because of some experience I've had. So the words of others can minister to us when we don't have words ourselves to speak to us. And we use those words to speak to us. That's very helpful. So walking with God and also singing uh, are great ways of uh, preserving our relationship and, and maintaining and redeveloping that, that freshness. Can you give us any more uh, practical spiritual disciplines or, or practices that you've found useful in maintaining your vitality in ministry? You know, I, I would place as number one thirst. When Jesus gave the, his great kingdom manifesto, his first four Beatitudes was an exposition of one word, thirst. Blessed are those who mourn, people who realize they are needy and are upset with the situation, whatever that situation is. Uh, oh, well, he started with blessed are the poor in spirit, um, which is again, you know, people who are aware of their need. Uh, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who uh, are meek, people who have no grounds for boasting. And then he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. If we can maintain our hunger, um, Richard Halverson was a pastor for many years in, in America and then became chaplain of the Senate. One said, the, the growing edge of the spiritual life is need. If we see ourselves as needy people, I think God will keep ministering to us. Uh, early in my ministry, I came across this figure. 
and my daughter-in-law has done a painting of that now. Uh, I call it the hungry baby bird approach to life. I don't know whether you've seen those pictures of baby birds looking up with their, you know, with their mouths, mouths wide open, wide open waiting and them, to be fed. Yes, <laughs> waiting to be fed. I think if we can maintain that hunger, that thirst, you know, sometimes um, I get quite distressed uh, when um, you come to church and the leaders of the church during the sermon time are in a room chatting, you know, and you think, you know, God, God speaks to us through the sermon. Maybe they have lost their desire to learn, you know. So, so that's, I would say, number one, to, to, to inflame or to keep our thirst going. And, and prayer, I mean, everyone talks about prayer, you know. Uh, and prayer, uh, again, I think that's so important because, uh, because not, not just as a habit, but it's our way of being alone with God, of being silent. Uh, you don't have to always pr talk when you pray. Uh, just the consciousness of knowing that I am in the presence of God. There is something that God's security begins to impact us by being consciously aware of being alone in His presence. Mm. The eternal God is our refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. I think burnout, the basic cause for burnout is not hard work. It's the drivenness that comes out of insecurity. And being in God's presence, just being there, can help us to, to let His everlastingness influence our littleness, that it makes us secure people. Um, you know, um, uh, it, it's very nice to, to see how people are getting used to having, to listening to podcasts of great preachers and all of that. And so, um, when, you, when you see people walking, very often you see them with their uh, you know, iPods or whatever listening. And I think it's a very good thing that has happened that people are doing that. But uh, uh, I don't, I consciously don't take anything when I'm walking. Walking is one of my pastimes. I just want to be alone, thinking, just allowing God to minister to me, to be silent. And, and I think uh, one of the things that prayer does is it gives us an opportunity to be silent. And that there is refreshment that comes from just doing nothing. You know, uh, uh, it was Blaise, Blaise Pascal who said, uh, he thinks in his confessions, oh, not confessions, but the Ponce, Ponce uh, which is uh, thoughts. Um, uh, he said, uh, he thinks that the biggest problem with people, he was talking about distraction, how we get distracted so that we can't listen to God. And he said, the biggest problem is something to the effect of that we can't sit in our room alone, you know, uh, just being alone. Uh, and then al along with that comes devotional study of the scriptures, you know. Um, I, I put the two together. Study is devotion, and devotion leads us to study because we want to find out what God has to give to us. So time spent in the Word daily, these, these are so basic, and yet, these are the things that keep us going. Now, I was wanting to ask you about that, because all the way through this interview, you've been coming out with scriptures yeah. to, to back up what you've been saying. You've been building it all on, on God's Word. Can you, can you help us in how, how do we cultivate a life of study and devotion from your own experience? How do you use... The, the scriptures to be able to maintain freshness and vitality in your own walk with God? You know, um, uh, we have this uh, well-known New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology yes. by Colin Brown. <laughs> and he starts the introduction to this. He starts by saying, bury yourself in a dictionary and come into the presence of God. Uh, a conscious awareness that this is the Word of God makes us want to study the Word. 
because we want more of God. And so, um, I am not a routine person. Uh, I don't take to prayer and Bible study, you know, like a duck takes to water. I have to make myself do it. I, am, I come from a family of workers. People might call me a workaholic, you know. Uh, I don't know whether I am, but uh, I, I work and I take to work easily. So I have to consciously, as an act of faith, say, God wants to speak to me today, and I want to go to the scriptures. And so that's the way I approach the scriptures, uh, as something that I have to study because I want to know what God has said. And so I try to approach scripture with the rigor of study. And I always have my pencils, my color pencils. I have a notebook with me. And at the end of every time that I spend in the Word, I write down, today I learned this. And I take that notebook with me wherever I go. So that's, that's something that I find very helpful. But I also think that studying what people have said about the Scripture, can be, you know, devotional reading. Uh, uh, more than devotional reading, expository and theological reading. Because that again builds this security that comes from a theological orientation to life, which is able to combat the competitiveness and the insecurity that is, as I said, the cause of burnout. You know, people who don't spend time theologizing can become very insecure people. Uh, uh, when I was a theological student, we had this wonderful bishop. He spent his time in India um, in, in working in the Tamil language, which is one of our languages in Sri Lanka. So Bishop Stephen Neal was, was a big name for us. And he came to our seminary. And he gave us some advice that I have never forgotten. He said, take a theological book and slowly read it. It may take you three, four months, but just read it slowly. And uh, that was about 40 years ago that I heard that advice, and I've been trying to follow that. Reading uh, expository, theological, biblically theological books. And again, this has a way of feeding us. I heard about a pastor who was burnt out and left the ministry. And uh, at the end of his, uh, uh, you know, of his time, he just left all his books in his library and left. And the person who succeeded him saw all these books of the former pastor. And he found that the earlier books had been theological and biblical books. The newer books that he had bought was all how-to books, how to do this, how to do that. You know, and, and the inference that he got from this was, this is a man who had stopped feeding his soul. He had been learning techniques. And if you don't feed your soul, you end up dry and insecure and a prime candidate for burnout. Ajit, thank you so much for your time and for sharing this with us. That may we all experience this freshness and vitality over a long period of ministry. May the Lord bless you. Thank, Thank you. you.